Okay, welcome to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for today's um, panel on archaeological career opportunities with agencies. I think we'd like to get started and um, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement and then we'll pass the mic over to our uh, moderator, Bill White. Nico. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the land acknowledgement. Um, the archaeological research facility is located in Huchin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chechenya speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and the future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all American Indian and indigenous people. So, all right, that, thanks. Um, yeah, right. yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for reading that acknowledgement, Nico. Uh, I'm Bill White, and I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. And it's my absolute pleasure to be here on this uh, panel with professionals. Uh, one of the things that I always look forward to is uh, you know, connecting with people who are working outside of academia, folks that are working with agencies and cultural resources companies to try to get my finger on the pulse of what folks are looking for out there and the students that we teach. And so, you know, I, I always find these um, panel discussions really informational and I enjoy uh, engaging with folks because I actually listen and, and take what you all say seriously and try to incorporate that into uh, what I'm teaching at Cal. And so uh, today, you know, I appreciate everyone showing up to this uh, panel discussion. Um, We've got a great cast of folks who work for several different agencies here in the state of California. These are the kind of folks who supervise and hire archaeologists. So students in the room, if you're here, you know, you're in the right spot. And uh, we've got several folks here. I think the, the way that this, uh, a good structure for this would be for folks to do, um, you know, a short introduction uh, to tell us all who you are and uh, what you do. And then after that, we have a couple of questions. And then, you know, as time allows, uh, we'll pass a couple of questions that we had from our email um, discussion, back chat, go through a couple of those. And then I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for uh, the students in the room to ask questions, too. So I've got a list of folks here in the email, and uh, I'm just going to go to my list and I'm going to ask folks to introduce themselves. And if you've got uh, a presentation or you want to tell us a little bit more about what you do at your agency, you know, now's the time. So I'm going to go to my list and is this, oh, it's in alphabetical order. So uh, apologies if I get this last name incorrect. Darren Andalina, please introduce oh, yourself. Perfect. Oh, all right, good. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Darren Andalina. I work for uh, California Department of Parks and Recreation. And as, as an archaeologist, I'm a supervisor for a specialized um, program called the Cannabis Watershed Protection Program. And basically what that is, is it's a team of us with, that includes law enforcement, um, natural resources uh, personnel, as well as facilities and maintenance personnel to help address the impacts to California park property from illegal cannabis cultivation. Um, you know, a lot of what we do has to do with like pesticide dumping and trash, but also um, part of that is um, the impacts to cultural resources. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, a really great team and, and Department of Parks and Recreation as far as I know, is the only landowning agency that actually includes full-time dedicated cultural staff to these types of activities. I mean, obviously illegal cannabis cultivation impacts lots of agencies and, and lots of landholders, but, but we actually have dedicated cultural staff, which is great. Um, and yeah, I think uh, that's about all I got to say about the work that I do. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, David Cohen, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Cohen. Uh, just to let you know where, where I am in terms of my connection to Berkeley, I received my doctorate from UC Berkeley in 2009 uh, as an anthropologist or archaeology. 
Um, I work now for the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, uh, in Region 9. Region 9 for FEMA covers California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, America and Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Um, so a big, big range for us. Um, I work within the Environmental and Historic Preservation Branch of FEMA in Region 9. Um, FEMA itself isn't uh, like a lot of federal agencies that have um, land or facilities or, or anything they're managing. We are uh, a mission-oriented agency where uh, we help people before, during, and after disasters. And my role within that EHP or Environmental Historic Preservation Branch to ensure that FEMA's actions are compliant with uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and then all the associated laws and executive orders that federal agencies comply with. Um, myself being an archaeologist, my specialty is, of course, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, working with state historic preservation officers, tribal historic preservation officers, uh, federally recognized tribes, other interested parties like state recognized tribes, um, and any, any, anyone else in the general public or uh, historic societies and the like. Um, it, and what FEMA is involved in is um, we become involved when there's presidentially declared disasters, but also when there's uh, projects to mitigate against future disasters. So I specialize a lot in the mitigation component, uh, less in the post-disaster uh, repair everything realm and more of the mitigating its future disaster, which um, I find more interesting in terms of uh, work as an archaeologist, because there's a lot more, uh, you're, you're building infrastructure and putting things in place and less of the just putting it back in place. Uh, so there's a lot more challenges. And I get to work with a lot of different federal agencies, uh, state and uh, state agencies as well, uh, just to help everyone along, along in that process. So. Thank you, David Cohen. Cal alum, all right, I like hearing that, I like seeing that. Okay, next alphabetically is Lynn Gassaway. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm another Cal alumni. I did my undergraduate, a class of 2001. So um, also Bay Area person, uh, got my master's degree at San Francisco State. So. I am uh, the Lassa National Forest Heritage Program Manager. I'm also the Tribal Relations Liaison and a Resource Advisor Coordinator for the Lassa National Forest. Uh, so as a Heritage Program Manager, that's sort of a fancy name for forest archaeologist. I oversee the archaeology that takes place on the Lassa, and we are about 1.2 million acres. We're one of, I think, 18 forests in California. So oversee all the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act work that takes place. We have three district archaeologists under, and then we hire crews every summer and um, work from there. I've also worked for the National Park Service, I've done some contract archaeology, and spent a year in Texas working. Uh, working for the Texas National Guard as an archaeologist. So at that background, spent most of my time in California. Um, all of our work on the Lassen goes from just digging a hole for a fence post all the way up to large, really large scale um, things like the Dixie fire that just happened this last summer, which was almost a million acres of land that burned, about 360,000 acres of that burned on the last National Forest, uh, which is a lot of work um, that we're going to be hiring for in the near, near future. Uh, I also specialize in fire, uh, go off, help other forests, uh, other parks uh, on protecting cultural resources during fire and doing tribal relations and protecting tribal interests during fires and suppression of those fires. Thanks, Lynn. I believe um, before the pandemic, I attended a great talk you gave on uh, fire archaeology. It was on campus here. So um, it's good to see that 
you know, you're still uh, working towards that, but kind of sad that the fires are so tragic and persistent that, you know, this is a continual event. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next on my list, I've got Starla Lane, please. My name is Starla Lane and I am a cultural resource specialist for pg and &E. um, I'm actually kind of snuck in here because we're not an agency. So pg and &E is actually an investor owned utility that has publicly traded stock. However, we're highly regulated by the California Public Utility Commission, right? So there's multiple utilities in California that have been, have, we kind of have our space that we're uh, operating in and providing uh, utility services. Um, so I have worked at pg e for a bit over six years. I've been a professional archaeologist for over 20 years now. Um, I did my undergrad at CSU Chico and I got my graduate degree at UMass Boston. Um, so pg e currently employs about 13 uh, cultural resource specialists. Um, and we have a service area that stretches from Eureka in the north down to Bakersfield in the south, um, from the Pacific Ocean in the west into the Sierra Nevada in the east. And then we have actually have assets that go beyond our service territory. So we have pipelines, gas transmission pipelines coming in from Topak down on the Arizona California border. So we've got our assets that we manage through the Mojave Desert and extending up to Modoc County um, on the Oregon border. So there's a lot of assets that um, pg e has to keep in cultural compliance uh, with the various state, federal and state laws. Um, so the 13 cultural resource specialists that are currently employed by pg e we each have a territory that um, we're assigned to. And within that territory, we oversee all cultural compliance in there. So what we do is, is that whether it's on private land, uh, if it has a state or federal nexus, um, so on land or a permit, that is issued by a federal or state agency. Uh, we work with our army of consultants. We suck up a lot of the consultants out there and resources. Um, we're making sure that they are producing work products um, and deliverables to submit to our agency counterparts. Um, we work with our tribal communities, both federally recognized and unrecognized communities um, that are assets to travel through their traditional lands and territories. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. So it's, it's really an interesting job um, because uh, you're doing cultural compliance for, you have to know federal laws, state laws, um, a lot of uh, collaboration uh, with stakeholders, uh, both external, whether there are our agency counterparts or tribal partners, um, and also internal because PG is also a construction company, right? We're building we're, we're doing everything from replacing a single distribution wooden distribution pole to building brand new transmission lines, gas transmission lines, building new, brand new um, uh, electric transmission lines, which have much different ground disturbance. And so the kind of, I think one of the interesting things about it is, is that we do actually get to see a project from, in the, like when they first conceive it, we see the initial engineering and we often have time have the opportunity to comment and help re-engineer things for avoidance and protection of cultural resources. Um, and along with uh, then when we have our assets on uh, federal or state lands that we're working with um, our colleagues and counterparts to ensure cultural avoidance of cultural resources, uh, that they're properly being managed and that pg and &E is doing everything in our power to help mitigate impacts. Oh, it's a huge job <laughs> for only 13 folks. I mean, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. All the things that all the activities that's going on there at PG&E. I, I didn't know, you know, as a person who's just the end user that turns on their light, I don't, it's all a mystery to me, right? And, until someone actually explains all the stuff that's going on. So, wow. I definitely hope that the questions come back around to you because there's a million questions I've got as well. Yeah. I want to make sure that everyone has time though, of course. Uh, so, uh, Next on my list, alphabetically, is uh, David Price, please. Thank you. Yeah, my name is David Price. I'm with the California Department of Transportation. I'm the Section 106 Coordinator um, here at Caltrans headquarters in Sacramento. And you may be thinking, we're a state agency. Why are you the Section 106 Coordinator? That's because we have been assigned lead federal agency status for federal aid highway projects by FHWA. So we are responsible for Section 106 and NEPA, um, in addition to CEQA and PRC 5024 and AB 52 compliance for our projects, which much like 
pg e we engineer and then often see all the way through um, to the end of uh, construction. Um, so in that um, role, uh, or I'm sorry, in this uh, uh, setting, my main role in the position is um, to um, uh, um, oversee statewide compliance um, uh, for our 140 plus uh, cultural resource specialists that work in district offices up and down the state. Um, and um, we comply with 106 and my main role as the 106 coordinator is to ensure compliance with our statewide programmatic agreement, uh, program level programmatic agreement. Um, and under that programmatic agreement, we uh, actually delegate, delegate a lot of responsibility to the district archeologists and so headquarters comes in on projects that actually have the potential to impact cultural resources or historic properties, um, which is still a lot, though nowhere near as much as if we had to consult uh, under the straight regs um, uh, with SHPO for no historic properties affected projects and, and similar other projects. So Caltrans has over 50,000 lane miles. We also administer federal funding um, for, through the Federal Aid Highway Project to local agencies. So there is an almost countless amount of lane miles and um, uh, 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 highway uh, acreage, uh, highway and non-highway acreage that we oversee Section 106 um, compliance on projects for. Um, that's about it. it. Says that's about it, but that's a lot. Once again, you know, 50,000 miles uh, you know, once again, this is definitely someone I would like to come back to in the questions. Um, the next person on the list, though, that I've got is uh, Ryland Thomas, please. Hey, uh, my name is Ryland Thomas. I'm an archaeologist with the Department of Water Resources. And um, I have an MA in anthropology from University of West Florida. I've uh, been working for DWR for about four years now, um, and uh, it's a pretty massive, um, uh, it's not a massive agency, but it's a good size agency, uh, and we're responsible mainly for uh, managing the state water project, um, which extends the entire length, practically, of the state of California and uh, water delivery in, in California. Um, and then we also have um, responsibilities for uh, flood protection and levy um, maintenance and management. Um, and then all of the infrastructure that's associated um, with that. Um, and then I am um, focused on the Lake Oroville area primarily um, and the Feather River drainage. Um, a lot of the work that I do here is in compliance with CEQA and Public Resource Code 5024. Um, and then we also have a, a FERC license in Oroville, that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, so there's also uh, Section 106 uh, compliance requirements up there. Um, and then we oftentimes have to get permits from the Army Corps. So there's, there's 106 uh, uh, applications um, with those permits as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we get to do kind of a variety of work. We do have a lot of consultants doing inventories and uh, effects analyses, but sometimes we get to do that on our own. Uh, it just depends on the scale of the project. Um, and then I'm also, so I'm, I'm doing technical work and doing archeological surveys, um, but also coordinating larger scale projects uh, with consultants. Um, and then uh, a, a big part of my job is tribal consultation with the Maidu community in this area. Um, so, you know, certain times of the year, that's 100% of my job for, you know, depending on, on uh, the stage of a project. And then other times of the year, I'm, I'm writing a technical report or out in the field doing inventory. And um, yeah, and then occasionally we do um, uh, some uh, large scale uh, archaeological mitigation, but that's few and far between. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's that's all I got to start. Yeah, that's great. Once again, really interesting, uh, really interesting work, and um, you know, once again, a huge range of things that uh, you're involved in and that you're uh, part of the administration of. Um, so uh, we have uh, seven total people, and last but definitely not least. Ms. Susan White, please tell us all, introduce yourself and tell us all uh, what you do. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Lynn White, and I am the Regional Heritage Program Manager with the Forest Service. Uh, and what that basically outlines uh, pragmatically is just, uh, as you've heard from Lynn, there's 18 great forests and 18 wonderful heritage program managers or forest archeologists for each of the forests in California. And I provide guidance and um, federal regulations and uh, as well as forest service policy. The old adage of the more you do archeology, span the less you do archeology, span I could say that now. I, <laughs> I rarely go out in the field nowadays, um, but uh, it's, been a, it's a bit of like a wonderful ride and stuff. So I try to uh, liaison between our forest archeologist and our big bureaucratic Washington office and the regional forester, that sort of thing. So a lot of politics involved there. Um, background had just come up the evolutionary scale of, of different types of jobs. Uh, before this, I was with Naval Base Ventura County, which is Port Wyneme and Naval Base, uh, Naval Air Station, Point Magoo. So I worked for the Navy. And before that, I was working for the Bureau of Reclamation, which does uh, dams and canals up in the state of Washington. So did a few years there. Um, also been to Guam, worked for the Air Force Base there in Guam, and uh, very fortunate in spending a good 10 years or so with the Oregon SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office. And uh, before that, many private firms, as well as being a county archaeologist, Sarasota County in Florida. And Brian, hello. I'm a Florida State undergrad and a University of Florida grad. <laughs> so have had a taste of many different areas and been extremely fortunate in how I've progressed in my career. I think that's it. <laughs> I'm old. Oh, that no, I, mean, I don't think so at all. <laughs> it's 25 years this year. I've been right doing full-time archaeology for 25 years, so I is old. <laughs> I'm well, almost it, no, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, experience, right? Yeah, Skill, that's go. what it is. Right? Vintage. Not old. We, Vintage. Yeah, we never get old. <laughs> we just get more experience, right? That's, that's what <laughs> we get. Go. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, this is awesome. This is excellent to hear um, all the different diverse things that everyone's doing here. And um, we had a, a couple of questions that were um, sent out um, through email to all the panelists and all the folks here. But, you know, I think the thing that's interesting that I forgot to put on there is asking folks, uh, you know, how they got their start. And so I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to address this because, um, you know, the students in the room, they're in that phase where either, you know, you have done some projects or you just really want to get into archaeology and that's the reason why you're listening to this and so hearing how people get their start i think is uh really important um so i know that we didn't ask that question but i don't think that anyone really ever forgets how they started in archaeology and you know I, I don't know how to organize this thing maybe i don't want to go on the same list thing i want folks when they're inspired to speak up um, but i think we have plenty of time here if you if you're interested and you're willing Please, someone start us off and tell us about your archaeology story. How did you get into this into this game? This is Lynn, and I'm willing to start that. All right. Um, you know, as an undergraduate at Berkeley, I just I started doing some CRM, just got some work for some companies around the Bay Area, and then uh, didn't really know what I was doing. Just somebody's like, hey. When you apply for, there's, you know, this thing, this website, you can apply for jobs all over the country. And uh, today, the job, that website is called USA Jobs. And you can go on and apply for any federal job, any archaeology job across the nation in any federal agency. And I did that. And I got a call one day. They said, would you like a job? And I went, sure. Where? Pennsylvania. I'm in, I'm in the Bay Area. 
and they say, you want to come to Pennsylvania and have an archaeology job with the Allegheny National Forest? I went, sure. So I had a job for the summer there. My, uh, I was up to this story. How, how do I get there? We'll get on Highway 80, drive 4,000 miles, exit, exit number 80, make a left-hand turn, drive 50 miles, and right there's where your office will be. <laughs> Couldn't be simpler. Uh, but, you know, two years in Pennsylvania, I then did, moved on to the Texas National jo Guard just by same thing, applying for a job, ended up there for a year, applied for another job off the of USA Jobs, ended up in Yosemite National Park, spent four years there, then in, in what we call a term position. My first jobs on the Allegheny were seasonal positions, like about six months a year. When I got to Yosemite, it was a term position, four years, and then I moved into a permanent job. I got another permanent job. I ended up at Whiskey Town outside of Reading. I worked for four parks there, um, Whiskey Town, Lassen Volcanic, Lava Beds, and Redwoods National Park. Um, while I was doing that, I went back to school, got my master's degree. Um, so I was got my permanent job and into my master's program within a month of each other and somehow ended up juggling both at the same time start really starting a permanent career and then I've just sort of jumped around since then I've just seen jobs applied for them ended up in Washington state then ended up down on the Sequoia National Forest for nine years and then on the Lassen for for six and I, and I will say as part of that journey within that career um, you know, I've ended up doing fire and that was sort of just one day my boss came up to me and said, Hey, um, we like your work. You ever thought about working, doing some fire stuff? And I went, I don't even know what that means, but if that means a job, yes. And so they sent me to fire training and yeah, 25 years later, I'm still doing fire. And I never thought I would like it. I, I never wasn't even really sure I would like federal service, but I love it because, and uh, just taking those opportunities and just sending out, you know, I, I don't know if I'll get this job, but just applying for it anyways. And, and, and then just taking the opportunistic places to go and move throughout your career. I never would have guessed I am where I am, um, but it's been a fun ride and I'm gonna keep riding it. Yeah. Bill, can I put a plug in? If anybody wants to be as cool as Lynn, right now the Forest Service is having a nationwide hiring event. It is actually geared toward recent graduates. Uh, Sarah has the email, there's, there's links to the USA Jobs to let you know that it is going to be uh, 21 to 28, so for you to apply. So get on the USA Jobs, just take the chance and you can have as exciting of a life as Lynn. So apply. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I'm glad you reminded us all, uh, Susan, because um, that's what this whole thing is about, trying to provide opportunities for folks, uh, students in the audience. Anybody else want to talk about their archaeology origin stories? Yeah, um, kind of, I don't know if this is similar to Lynn, but um, I had, uh, done a couple of field schools in undergrad in Kentucky, and um, uh, uh, and I don't even know if this is still a thing, but a uh, professor suggested the, um, I look into the Student Conservation Association, uh, SCA, um, and if you can get a job through USA Jobs as uh, straight out of undergrad, go for it. That's awesome. You're getting paid, um, but uh, and what I did instead um, was uh, the SCA, you basically apply through their website and to a variety of different positions. And it's usually US Forest Service or National Park Service um, and then other land management agencies. And the first gig I got, and this was 12 years ago now, um, was on the Stanislaus National Forest. And I came all the way out here um, for a seasonal gig on the Stanislaus and uh, with Priscilla Rifkall. And, um, and we had, and the cool thing about being an intern who's not actually getting paid um, is you usually get to do some of the coolest projects. 
um, and get to do like fun field work, or that was my experience. So um, yeah, we were doing archeological surveys in the Tuolumne River Canyon and just rafting on a weekly basis and, and getting out at various sites and doing site recordation and survey. And yeah, it was a dream. Um, and then I actually did a couple more gigs like that um, on the Daniel Boone National Forest and then um, uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, and then I went to grad school. Um, so I had a little bit of experience before I went to grad school, um, which kind of helped me a lot. And then when I finished up there, um, then I applied to jobs through USA Jobs. I had, you know, I had the degree and I could kind of go that route. But um, Susan, Lynn, if, if folks can get jobs with just a field school as a tech through USA Jobs right now, then yeah, I would totally encourage them to do that. Make money, don't just like, yeah, get put up in, in uh, park housing and not and get a, a weekly stipend. That's not ideal, but. <clears throat> That's how I started. Still pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll jump in now to, uh, to okay, yes. a, 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 a um, competitive bid for Cal Careers instead of USA Jobs, which is where you'd go to uh, Caltrans or to go to get hired at Caltrans. Um, you may have heard of a recent massive infusion of cash into infrastructure. Um, we're hiring. Uh, in fact, there is a, a huge glut of positions and not enough people to to hire them. Caltrans hires, um, you know, everywhere from consult. Well, we don't. We, we directly, you know, con contract. So we have uh, um, a lot of effect in, in hiring both consultants from the private firm all the way through. And we're actually hiring for Caltrans ourselves, basically up and down the state right now. Um, I got my start. I, it's a little different than a lot of people. Both my parents were archaeologists. Uh, my mom for the state and my dad for the private side. And when I was 18, I was delivering pizzas and uh, my dad came to me at one point and said, hey, we need someone to uh, use a breaker bar to punch 50 centimeter holes through asphalt in downtown Napomo and uh, said I was perfect for it. <laughs> so I went out and I think it was 10 bucks an hour or something like that at the time. And it was the best money I'd ever made. Um, and so I said, hey, can I keep doing this? And they, the company said, if you want to, you need to spend the next six months sitting in a lab sorting uh, old glass and flakes. Um, so I went from breaking holes through asphalt to uh, doing lab processing. And from there worked part-time and then eventually full-time for, for, for that firm. Um, at a certain point, I realized I wanted to go a little bit further, go into more of a, a man well, managerial, you know, supervisory or, or uh, more Kind of advanced role and realized that uh, needed a master's degree so i decided to go to sonoma state which had a, a, a degree geared specifically towards cultural resource management um, and was um, focused on historic archaeology though i did my thesis and, and trained classically more more towards the prehistoric side um, and then once i got that um, degree actually uh, caltrans was hiring i decided to um to look for jobs, uh, both on USA Jobs and on Cal Careers, actually. Um, and Caltrans was hiring a position near where I was. They let me start before I'd even finished my thesis um, and finished my thesis while I was working for Caltrans. And uh, that was in 2015. And seven years later, that was in District 3 and right out of Sacramento. Um, and seven years later, I'm working at headquarters in Sacramento. Um, in the 106 position. So there is, you know, I started as a tech on a particularly horrible job uh, and am now working at headquarters. So there's there's uh, advancement opportunities at Caltrans. And yeah, I'll plug Cal Careers again. <laughs> I love it. There's always something to be said to just human pile driver in archeology span that, you know, that, that opens doors for you. Literally, if you have a, you know, eight pound steel bar in your arms, you can open the door <laughs> or you can, you know, you can use that to have someone open it for you. You say exactly. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Um, I'll go. Uh, yes, please. I uh, started out actually as an undergrad at CSU Chico 
And I would encourage anybody to like reach out to your professor, like reach out, look for the opportunities at your university because a lot of times people aren't taking advantage of them. Um, so I started at 19 uh, working in the ARC lab at Chico State um, and they had at the time a very robust kind of uh, cultural resource management program coming out of there. So they were doing projects underneath the research uh, aspect of the university. So we would go up and I'd go with a more senior archaeologist and we would go and do timber harvest surveys on the national forest. Um, I helped put together a bunch of site records for a project called uh, the Sites Reservoir, uh, which is still an ongoing kind of off water thing that they're they were looking at doing, but that was one of the first projects I was working on. Um, so I was very fortunate that I got a ton of experience I was paid. It was my work study. They were very flexible with my university schedule. Um, and by the time I finished my undergrad, I had more work experience than most graduate students did um, at the at the university. So definitely look for those, whether it's an internship, whether it's work study, whether it's volunteering, start getting that experience sooner than later. Um, after I finished up at Chico State, I did go straight on to grad school at uh, UMass Boston. And um, I worked with a gentleman there named Steve Solomon, and my uh, thesis was actually uh, on the second oldest reservation in the United States in the Eastern Pequot Reservation, which was established by the Connecticut colony. And so that really shaped, helped and shaped me as an archaeologist because it was working with a dissident community, it was working in collaboration with them, and it taught me a lot about what really honest and truthful consultation was and having conversations that might be uncomfortable, but everyone needed to have them and the importance of those conversations. Um, so that also was, you know, going to that program. And then I worked, I worked in the lab there. So I, because I had the experience at Chico State, I was funded to um, go in and start working in, in the lab at UMass Boston right off the bat too. Um, when I came back to California, I was a staff archaeologist for a year at Chico State. Um, and then we moved down to the Bay Area um, and I started working at a place or for a firm called Pacific Legacy, which is based in Berkeley. And I was there at Pacific Legacy for eight years as a staff archaeologist there before I came to um, pg and &E. So that's like I would like I said, I would just really, really take advantage of those opportunities out there to get the experience so you can put it on your resume that you can show you've got the skills and that you've got variation in your experience. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it does seem like there's definitely a trend of folks going from many different things, uh, testing the waters and just, you know, moving around, getting that experience. But David, I think I saw you. Go ahead. Yes. Yep. Okay. So I, I on an interesting kind of archaeology, I, I, as an undergrad, I was in, a, I went to school in New York City for film and television. So I had an idea I was going to be, uh, I was going to do you know, film, sound, recording, and, and uh, that, that was my route to kind of like art house cinema. Uh, I was going to be a poor artist for a while. I had an outside course I had to take and ended up taking archaeology. Um, hooked up with a guy there, was inspired, uh, went in a field school to uh, southwestern France to do an excavation of Paleolithic rock shelter. Through that, picked it up as a second major, which is kind of weird for all of my colleagues in art school or in film school that I was doing some like second major like that, um, but I ended up just being inspired uh, coming to grad school at UC Berkeley through that um, and sort of making a path. You know, I have kind of a kind of a punk DIY kind of ethos to myself. So kind of, you know, I, I didn't find I really liked the idea of archaeology in, in the public realm and um, public education. So I liked the idea of teaching, but I wasn't super keen on being at a university teaching. I really wanted to be out teaching in other venues. Um, so I ran the public outreach program at actually the archaeological research facility for a while. Um, did stuff like art exhibit or archaeology exhibits at Asian Art Museum, outreach to public schools. Uh, so a lot of different things that was putting together. And so the whole time trying to get experience for myself in what can I do with my archaeology degree that's not in academia. Um, so you know, looking at museums, looking at um, other venues, so CRM for a while, worked on a number of projects. Just trying to get lots of experience, figuring things out. Um, so out of grad school, I was doing adjuncting at Bay Area Universities for a little while, but during that time, doing CRM. But I, I saw an opportunity with um, getting in terms of, uh, you know, a path toward what I was looking for, working for a federal agency, potentially, or another agency at the public service. 
Um, and I, I saw that I needed to learn the laws and develop a lot of skill sets. So I started looking at environmental firms in California. So I started working for small environmental firms, learning not just the archaeology, but also um, greater components like CEQA, um, working with biologists and learning sort of how what I was doing fit into the larger picture of the environmental compliance that we were doing. Um, so through that, I started doing uh, more federal compliance for, the, for, for NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, got to do, got to, always looking for opportunities for different companies to step up, learn more, um, you know, really toward that goal of saying to a, you know, apply to a federal agency and saying, I know what I'm doing. I know, I know the laws, know what I'm doing. So finally got to a point where I was working for a, a national environmental consulting firm that did federal compliance for different federal agencies. So that was a really cool experience to be able to get that job. Um, that was my first experience at the FEMA, but also working for a ton of other federal agencies across the country, FAA. Um, I found myself out doing surveys um, up in Idaho with an EPA Superfund site. Uh, I had to fly out to New Jersey once to dig a hole behind a fire station for a project for compliance out there. Uh, so just tons of experience through those, those opportunities of looking at the consulting firms um, and really getting that background experience. And that was my intro to FEMA. Um, and when the job came up with FEMA in the Region 9 office here in Oakland, I seized the opportunity, applied for it, didn't get it. <laughs> I saw another job come up, applied for it, didn't get it. Uh, I think it took about three or four times applying for the exact same job to then get called up um, through the opportunity to, to get into the, the federal system. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think it took knowing the people at the agency, so them seeing my name pop up on a list of candidates and saying, oh, he's doing work for us as a contractor. We work with him. Um, and that was a really kind of good intro to myself to, you know, get my foot in the door to kind of really go for that public service aspect that I was looking for. So it was a weird path that kind of finally got me there. And I got a lot of experience along the way. Yeah, that's great. It doesn't seem like there is a, you know, ladder. It's like, like a meandering stream with a lot of different braids and, you know, pathways uh, all headed towards the place where everyone's at here. I'll throw in another plug towards getting that experience, especially that prof some professional experience, even if it's, you know, just not towards the, towards your career, but, but doing some sort of, you know, cultural resource compliance work outside of the, of the school track that's not that's not towards your your um, um, degree, uh, you know. At Caltrans, we look for various things when we're hiring. But once you're hired, we have basically a tiered system of of um, uh, certification for you to be able to do certain tasks under our programmatic agreement. This is something that's required um, for us to have for you to be able to do things and. Some people can feel there's the opportunity once you get to Caltrans, there's so much work to do. There's so many projects or something like that, that um, you're overseeing a lot of work. You're not doing a lot of work, but to be a PI, to be a principal investigator, you know, for us, you have to have that experience. You have to have experience as a lead, uh, a, a, a supervisory experience in the field. You have to have lab experience. You have to have um, excavation experience. Um, so it can be hard to get once you're actually at Caltrans, once you're actually at another agency to actually be doing that field work. So it's really, really helpful. Um, and, uh, it, and, if, and, and I couldn't you know, recommend it enough if you have the opportunity to do that stuff before you're actually um, attempting to get into a public agency. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just really helpful. I, I shouldn't say that that's, uh, you can't do that when you're at Caltrans or when you're at another agency. Um, it's just, it, it can be harder. Um, so again, getting that that very uh, varied kind of experience before you actually apply is, is invaluable. Yeah, I'm glad you added that, David. That's a great segue. I want to make sure there's a couple folks. I don't know if you want to share your archaeology origins or if we should just let them remain shrouded in mystery in a, in a deep time, you know, a time before time. There's a couple of folks. All right. I'll, I'll I'll give oh, it. Oh yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. Cool. I, I, yeah, my experience I don't want to call out names. <laughs> pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I did my undergrad at UC Davis, and I was really fortunate that um, the graduate students that ran my field school um, all had experience in CRM, 
and they were pretty plugged into the CRM community. So in addition to teaching us, you know, proper um, methodology and, and grounding us in the theoretical background of the work we were doing, they also were able to help train us on, hey, these, these are the techniques that you're gonna be using, real world techniques in the field doing CRM. And so that was invaluable. And then when, um, when I graduated and was looking for jobs, those were the contacts that I had within the CRM world. So it's just, it's about people and relationships. And, and uh, so I was lucky enough that I had done a good enough job at, at my field school that they you know, wanted to hire me. And, and that was my segue in. And then um, I, I spent about 20 years on the private side of things. Um, start out well. Start out as a dig bum, working for you know various companies, and then got hired on by Far Western, um, and spent the bulk of my private career um, at Far Western, and then got my graduate degree. Um, moved on to some different environmental firms, and yeah, you know, after 20 years, kind of like uh, David said, I, I really had this idea that I wanted to do public service. Um, I really appreciated uh, the preservation ethos of of state parks. Um, you know, really trying to preserve and manage and protect resources, you know, for future generations and for, you know, descendant communities. And, and so finally, after, after I said about 20 years, I uh, decided to jump over to the agency side of things. That's great. I, I, st I think that's really interesting, too. It seems like there's also a trend, too, of many folks uh, either working in the private sector and then working for the government or going back and forth for a while before they're fully working for agencies. I mean, that, that definitely is something I'm picking up on here. Well, I've, I've got a question, uh, but I, I'm, I'm ready to go on because I'm, I'm starting to see where we're transitioning more towards uh, conversations about skills that you all have and, you know, how that all uh, unfolded. And so, you know, we've also heard as people are announcing themselves that there's jobs out there, right? Everyone in the room is like, you know, taking notes right now to try and figure out how they can apply to these jobs, right? So I'm just going to uh, open it up to everyone here too and ask, um, you know, what are the kind of things that you're looking for in applicants that are coming out of college? I mean, it doesn't have to be just entry level, you know, what, what are the kind of things that you all see get people promoted uh, higher up the ladder? Um, but then, you know, many of the folks here are entry level. What are you looking for when you see that application come across your desk? And I mean, I'm going to open this up to everyone, but some folks are actually hiring right now. And there may be someone in this room who is uh, eligible to be hired. So what are you all looking for right now? I can start again. Uh, you know, if you're co coming in um, and you're applying for a forest service job and the this would be the same for like the park service or the BLM. Um, and you, you're applying for a lower level job, which we call them, we have GS levels and an entry level field uh, person, an archeological technician is a GS five or a GS seven is usually a crew chief. So if you're just going in as just a, a five to be a, on a crew, I'm really looking for people who um, have got out of that field school, got, you know, how to do transects, how to identify archaeological sites, how to um, do a site, write a site record. Um, I'm not so interested in you knowing all the background of prehistory and the local tribes, you know, you're going to get that when you're there. And if you get the opportunity to write a report, but as a lower level, you really, the nuts and bolts of how to be a field archaeologist and that you can hike all day long and you can identify um, artifacts and site types and then know how to measure them and record them and then if you have that experience then the crew chief you know have you um, supervised people at all how do you work with people and and that starts to get into the oh i can write a report i can write a summary of what we did i i write daily notes i uh, pay attention to people and and maybe a little bit of that background of how to how to do the research and especially like pre-field research like you know how to uh, draw maps or GIS to determine what sites are already in the project area that you're going to have to go re-record and then um, how do you uh, write it up at the end. It's 
Yeah, that's great. What else are y'all looking for? I, I'm like I, feverishly writing notes. Go ahead. I, I think it's interesting. You know, she, we said we're not, Lynn said we're not looking for your intimate knowledge of prehistory or something like that, right? And I think that's a really good point. We're kind of taking it for granted that you come um, with uh, basic knowledge of of pre or of 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 archaeology and and the 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 topics that are covered uh, in an, in an archaeological ex, uh, um, uh, education. Often we're going to be asking you for knowledge specifically of compliance with 106. You know, with um, skills in uh, um, we're going to be asking you questions about um, you know consultation, experience with Native Americans, experience in dealing with difficult situations, um, and, and, and really kind of getting, trying to get an idea for, for how, um, for, for the skills that you have in a compliance setting and dealing with the things that you have to do to deliver a project or something like that, specifically for Caltrans, I'm saying here, to deliver a project in a compliance setting. Um, so, you know, we're not going to be asking you say, hey, we're in Sacramento, give us a detailed history of the material culture in the Delta or something like that, right? We're, we're looking much more to the compliance side. That being said, it's still really, really important to, 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 to have that information on, on hand and not to let it lapse. Because once you are hired, you know, once you are working here um, and you're doing compliance, compliance, once you're eventually getting to say, sending um, effect assessments or something like that to the to the California SHPO, um, um, it, it gets re it, it's re to be able to show, say, archaeological effects, you really have to connect that to the academic stuff that you're learning, right? Uh, an archaeological site or a, a building, um, I assume most people here are probably in archaeology, um, but an, so, so I'll stick to that and that's my, my wheelhouse too. An archaeological site has significance, right? We're defining our effect, which is a legal term, to the ability of that archaeological site to show significance, which is often data, which is now connected to your academic education, to your education, right? To your understanding of prehistory, to your understanding of the archaeology. You need to be able to do up to have up-to-date knowledge of the topics, of the themes of the research questions that are relevant to that analysis. So while when we're hiring, we're not going to be specifically asking you that stuff, um, it will still come into play. Yes, Susan, please. Yeah. I'm still in school, raise my hand, right? That's okay. <laughs> really, and just to follow up, uh, what was said was before, which is really great, I kind of like thought about what to put in the resume um, in the sense that many of the jobs, especially the federal, you go on USJ jobs and you just click the boxes of what you qualify for. You can do attachments, upload attachments to your application. And that's where I thought that you could bring out your unique qualities in the resume. Uh, what I'm thinking is that if you're just coming out of courses and stuff, if there's coursework related to the position that you're applying for, like for the federal jobs with uh, federal regulations, cultural resource management, field schools, make mention of that. If it's something that is out of state or unfamiliar, give yourself a couple of sentences to explain what it was and how long you spent there. Sometimes there's a two week field school, sometimes there's a three month field school. So take the opportunity to give a little bit more meat to what you're putting in your resume for field schools. Um, one thing to remember, that does take into consideration, especially just coming out of school, is volunteer opportunities. If you did actually volunteer uh, for a uh, field school, or for not field school, but for, for excavation, or for any type of historical society, put that in. Volunteer experience does come into play when considering these positions. And also, if you have any writing examples, just like Lynn was saying, is that when you go through sometimes with field tech, you kind of want, if you want to advance with your career, having those examples of critical writing, having that foundation of being able to convey both kind of the technical as well as theoretical uh, points in your uh, writing. So if you have uh, reports, you know, your thesis, that sort of thing, attach it, attach it. And the uh, other thing I thought too, uh, if you want to make sure that you're putting into your resume are presentations. If like with the SCA or you attend the SAA, even the attendance itself, 
sit down when you're attending these archaeological societies and especially when you're giving a presentation because that shows us that you have experience in public speaking which many times when you go through your career in archaeology you're going to present to the public as well as talking to tribes so those kind of things that not just are in your coursework but those unique qualities that bring out what you feel would be most contributing to the position you're applying for so I'll hush I definitely agree with Susan. Definitely want to see that you've had a field school um, that preferably would cover all aspects of archaeology, including, you know, survey as well as excavation. I mean, that's definitely great to see on an incoming resume. Um, in addition to that, one, one piece of advice for when, uh, especially at parks, when you're applying is um, typically for the application, we put in a duty statement. And I definitely recommend paying very close attention to that duty statement. There's going to be kind of key words throughout it that the duty statement is going to describe what your duties will be. Make sure that you craft uh, any sort of written response, if there is a written response for that application, or your resume to highlight and show that you have the experience with those specific job requirements. Um, you know, sometimes I see people who look like really qualified candidates, um, but they but they they don't pay attention to that duty statement and don't include the details in that application. And you know, like any agency, there's it's not just um, the cultural resources folks who are making the determination on who gets hired. It's also admin, you know, people who aren't cultural resource specialists. So if you if you don't like really frame your application to match that duty statement sometimes it doesn't you know get passed through um, the appropriate channels so that's just a bit of advice on that front yeah i would like to also uh second what uh darren just called out um at pg e when you apply for a job it's going to actually go to HR. Um, it does not come directly to the cultural resource department and there's going to be people in HR and they look for keywords. So you need to make sure to craft um, your resume, your whatever you're submitting so that it clearly shows if the job says you need five years experience, make sure it shows five years experience. Like make sure that whatever is required for the job description is clearly laid out and it's in there and it's easy to find. Because like I said, what they're going to do is they're going to take a subset of applicants and they're they're going to forward it on to the hiring panel. And so we're not we don't get to see all of the people. We can't say, oh, you know what? I, I know this person is qualified. They accidentally left that out. That's we're not even going to know you applied. So do pay attention to um, the job postings and the job descriptions and make sure that you're addressing all the necessary requirements and, and demonstrating that. Um, you know, uh, besides PG&E, um, there's a lot of other utilities that hire. There's a lot of cities and counties. There's a lot of actual agencies beyond the big um, state parks or federal uh, forests or whatnot that have cultural resource specialists. So um, depending on what that agency's job is, also tailor your resume to that. When I applied for pg and &E, I made sure to call out every linear project I'd ever worked on, every transmission line, every, you know, things that showed that I understood things that were long and crossed multiple jurisdictions, you know, I really tried to highlight it. So make sure you highlight experience in your resume too for the job that you're applying for. Um, at pg and &E, when we hire, um, it's, you know, the, our roles are pretty complex in that uh, we have times when we are doing all the internal stuff. I, I do reviews all the time. So you do have to have a strong fundamental knowledge of how to do archaeology, what sensitivity is, where, what warrants uh, going out and doing field work, what's, you know, all of this stuff. And then on the other hand, we also have to look at um, what our consultants are providing us, right? And so when you get hired at pg e you're expected to have kind of enough experience that you can look at something and say, is this adequate, right? Um, can I take this deliverable that was handed to me and then can I then go over to the agency that I am asking the permit from that we're gonna go and do work on the, the federal or state agency and say, hey, here's, here's my evidence that pg and &E is in compliance with all the necessary cultural resource laws. So you have to have enough background to see if something kind of passes the sniffs test, so to speak, right? What, is it adequate? Is it enough? Uh, sometimes it can be too much, right? Like there, there is going way too far for a pole replacement on a slope of that's over 35%, right? It's 
is there's not necessarily a sensitivity there depending on the context. Um, also uh, demonstrate project management because you're gonna have a large workload. Um, organization skills, even if you don't have a lot of experience, like show, show that you can organize in, in interviews, in your resume, show that you have organization skills and make sure your, or your resume is organized. We've, I've seen some in the last few years where it's like people just like yelled at me in a single paragraph, right? And so when I'm looking to hire somebody, that doesn't give me confidence in their communication skills or their organization skills in a job that can be very fast paced, very quick turnaround. We're helping to ensure critical infrastructure is maintained and in compliance. Um, so those are those are some things. And then uh, if you can get budgetary experience, because you're also expected to cut contracts to manage budgets, going back to actually having some practical experience in the industry, you should have an idea of actually how much something costs to do. Um, those are all key skills that we kind of look for that, you know, there is, and then in addition to the compliance, like right, we really want people to understand um, that their means is to an end. And a lot of times with um, people, especially coming out and young in their careers, I was like it too. I didn't really understand what my, why I was doing my job, why I had a job. Um, understanding what that end is really improves the product in your deliverable because you understand your level of effort, what needs to go into it. Um, what the compliance piece that's really driving us to do that cultural resource management work. These are all golden, golden tips. Of course, you know, folks don't get discouraged because none of the folks speaking had all of that stuff immediately, right away. I mean, archaeologists are not born, we're created. So it's great to have all these things, but it takes a while. You know, everyone here, definitely examples of many years of persistent and steadfast work. That's how they got to this level. So don't get discouraged right away when they're saying that you need all those things. These are the things that they would like for you to have and you have your entire life to gain those skills, right? I, I, I love all that stuff. Um, uh, you know, if anyone, if, if everyone's okay, I have another question to add because in the background here, academia, universities are undergoing like a transformation and it's not cool like transformers into some you know awesome jet it's more like you know uh seismic shifts like you see in the um, disaster movies and one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how we can prepare students to be able to work with all of y'all so uh, one of the questions that we asked uh, in the email is you know where do you see academia doing a good job and where do we need some work there's some folks in here myself you know that are teaching students that work for the university we'd love to know how we can make things better so you know what what does academia need to fix what do we need to do and what are some of the things that we're already doing well i mean you can we're tough enough you can just start with what are the things that we need to do and then if you have any breath left at the end what are the positive things or you can start with the positive and go to negative so you know what do, what do you need us to do to help you all out Well, I think like a lot of people have uh, chimed in already is the, the regulatory side of things. You know, me as an undergrad at UC Davis, I mean, I, I maybe in my AMP3 intro to archaeology, there was a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe a half a day, a couple hours on regulatory compliance and what the laws are that covered um, what, what we do in CRM. Um, and so I really had to learn that on the fly. Uh, and luckily I worked for companies that were willing to send me to trainings, 106 trainings, eco trainings, those sorts of things to, to pick it up as I went along in my career. But I definitely think that, um, it would benefit undergrad students to have a greater foundation in why CRM exists. What, what's the regulatory background and, and um, legal background and justification for what we do. Yeah, I totally second that. It's, you know, that's, I think that's what I never had in, in my training in, in, you know, in grad school. No, never anyone discussing that compliance aspect, but also the important, uh, you know, the, the analytical aspect of section 106 and you know, the, the different decision making that goes into something. Um, and the, the kind of analytical process in terms of, say, determining uh, an effect or working with a consulting party, working with a tribe, um, on, you know, surrounding a particular action that needs to be taken. 
So really understanding the, um, you know, the decisions and the negotiations and the discussions that go into that. You know, so as much as kind of in academia, the, the you know, case studies that can be taught or examples, documents that laid out like a, a memorandum of agreement that was put together, um, seeing the pieces that went into play with that, um, those kind of things like, you know, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation always has examples on their side of um, things to look at. You, know, you have examples of programmatic agreements to look at. You can see the decision points a federal agency um, or, or you know, another agency like Caltrans might have in terms of their analysis that they go through. Um, these, it's, it's always important, you know, we, we sometimes get people applying for jobs or interviewing for jobs that can't even explain the process and what they would go through and the thoughts behind what they would need to do. Um, so those, that would be a big, uh, you know, a good teaching skill, a lot of you know, case studies and examples. Um, I, there's this, this book that always comes to mind, which I always think is really cool. It's a great book and I always plug it for people and the teaching uh, classes. Uh, it's, a, it's a book called Where the Lightning Strikes by Nabokov. And it's a really interesting book about case studies working with Native Americans um, and you know, particular cultural resources aspects. So it's, a, it's one I always plug. Um, I think it's you know, good for these kind of bigger thought processes of you know, how, how to uh, take views into play, but also the, you know, the, the, the action the federal agency might need to take or might be wanting to take um, in that process that goes, that goes with that. So you know, there's a lot of thought, I think, anyone here can, that works in cultural resources and compliance. It's not, it's not cut and dry all the time. Uh, there's a lot of parties at play and, and thoughts that come into, in, into that process. I'll kind of piggyback off that actually. I, I, I agree completely. And um, something I think that, that it would help to start learning early in, especially as part of your education is the appropriate approaches to technical writing. And I'll, I'll, I'll try not to go off on a billion tangents like I did in my last answer, but brevity and concise arguments in technical writing are extremely important. Um, when you're getting your education, you're focusing on content and cool stuff. And But as David said, when you get to a compliance side, um, what you're trying to do is translate that specifically into where that rubber hits the road when it comes to you know, your effect, say, under 106. Being able to translate that effectively um, based both on the, the academic content and also on how that translates to the legal language and how you might have to translate that for other people, right? When you're dealing, say, with, with um, um, descendant groups that, that don't speak in 106 language or something like that, the ability to, to, to briefly and concisely put that argument on paper in the appropriate reports and in the appropriate context is just invaluable. It just saves a lot of time. And if you can demonstrate that you are able to do that, it goes a, a long way. Yeah, and I'll add to the plug on that. For the learning the section 106 process, a, a good little book to start with is just by Thomas King, the Federal Planning and Historic Places, the 106, the section 106 process. Um, just a great overview and he helped write the law. So not many people know it better than he does. Um, but yeah, learning that, uh, you know, as you get through the, just how to do field work and writing up just basic reports. And yeah, you know, the next thing we go into is what is the full section 106 process? And then how does it interact with other laws, especially the National Environmental Protection Act or NEPA and learning how to write that figuring out uh, effects, um, whether you have an adverse effect versus a, a no effect. Um, can you do things with insights or not? And how do those uh, projects affect that site's national register eligibility? So what, how does a site be, get onto the national register knowing that and then knowing what would affect that site um, is really what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and is going to help you throughout your career. The more you can understand how those uh, laws interact with each other and, uh, and, and then the writing. I think the academic part and getting the detailed part um, and learning how to write concisely um, is going to help you go a long way. It 
if I can interject, just I'm just thinking that um, and don't mind, there's a cat that goes by every once in a while. <laughs> Teleworking, yay. <laughs> that uh, one of the successes and and what I would advocate that the in the academic setting um, in the anthropology department is uh, theory and, and field methods. And that what I'm thinking is uh, or another very old ancient joke coming from long ago uh, is that what we do in CRM is compliance, not science. However, if you have the foundation of um, archaeological theory, the, the history of archaeological theory, how it's evolved over time, in conjunction to how our field methods have evolved over time, both technically and just how we interact, uh, what was done, you know, 20 plus years ago, and how people are doing surveys. And now we have tribal monitors, you know, I mean, th those things did not exist in the past, or they weren't thought of or considered. So having that good archaeological theory back uh, foundation, as well as uh, field methods in the sense that if you are able to do a full fledged uh, field school that incorporates, you know, full scale excavation is like, <laughs> take, take the opportunity now because when you go into when it's working, it's much quicker, that sort of thing, it's abbreviated, that sort of thing. Um, and those uh, for in the academic sense, if it could be transitioned or say, okay, here's the academic foundation. This is the application of our, this is how it's used for cultural resource management, for fulfillment of our uh, federal regulations, that sort of thing. And I think that um, having that transition to archeological theory into its application with uh, compliance with uh, cultural resource laws and policies is a great showing that um, demonstration of how the foundation serves and what you're doing in the continuing future. The one big thing that I would advocate is um, in the teaching of the federal regulations and also tribal relations to as much as possible invite tribal representatives uh, to come and speak because uh, they will give you a totally different perspective. It, and um, what you're thinking is that if that's not possible to reach out and see whether there's events or maybe you can attend a tribal council, that sort of thing, um, that those opportunities now that when you're in or just graduating from a uh, university are the prime times to start learning how to interact with tribes in a respectful way so that when you are in a position working for an agency or a private firm, you have that foundation. I came from the Southeast where, especially in Florida, there's not a lot of descendant tribes. And I went from there to Oregon where there are a lot of descendant tribes. And I had a big learning curve to, to, to overcome that sort of thing. And it's been very fun, but I'm just thinking the exposure that you have now to uh, descended tribes, their outlook, their attitude, and also how they interact with agency is extremely valuable. So I couldn't second that harder, by the way. That's such a great point. Uh, you know, I, I, when I had the benefit of, of getting thrown right into the private side doing field work, and a lot of that was monitoring. Um, even though monitoring really should be done by the most experienced people, often it's done by the least experienced people because it's it's kind of grueling. Um, but so I had the opportunity to stand next to a lot of Native Americans and hear their opinion on opinions on a lot of what was going on. When I then went on to say get my master's degree, we learned a lot about how important it was to um, include tribal perspectives to expand the theory that we were that we were developing to try to include other perspectives. One thing it didn't include was a whole lot of talking to Native Americans though. So we kind of were going, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're hurtling down tracks, right? Without realizing whether it's tracks that the people we're studying care about. So it's, so it, it, it from, from, you know, your, from Berkeley's standpoint to, to, to facilitate that interaction is, is just gonna be, it would be so beneficial and it would be beneficial when you're coming to getting hired as well. I'm um, just being able to say that you've had that interaction. And, and actually, Susan, what, what you were saying brought up another thing, and I'm sorry, please just somebody put up their hand and tell me to stop talking at any given point. But um, um, you were talking about method, field methods, right? And, and those translating appropriately. And, and, and I wanted to second that too, and say that when you're teaching theory, when you're teaching field methods, say in a field school to students, one of the best things you can do is make a clear connection that those methods are meant to do a certain thing. When we are designing our field studies, right, and we get a consultant field study that says it's go, it's supposed to fulfill this 
action, right? Or that's supposed to fulfill this need, this need to know what, you know, what part of a site is going to be intersecting with this part of the project or something. They pretty often will get studies that are not designed in a way that actually fulfills that need. Um, they, you know, they haven't given thought to how deep a how deep something is going, their, their, their sampling methods, whether that's a sufficient sample to actually be able to know what's happening, right? The difference between a 10 centimeter auger and a one by one gets you a much different sample, right? So, so connecting those, those field methods that you're teaching um, uh, to, to the goals that they're attempting to fulfill is, is, would be, is really critical. Yeah, this is all great stuff to hear. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things. I wanted to make sure that we have enough time to uh, uh, go into rooms so that folks can, um, you know, hear more on a, a closer, uh, you know, closer space. Um, but I also want to make sure that people in the audience have space to ask the questions that they want to ask that are for everyone, right? And so, you know, we've got one here in the discussion. And I think, you know, maybe for like the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, well, uh, address questions from the general audience, and then maybe Sarah can set up some uh, breakout rooms for folks to meet with the, the audience in a you know a smaller space where people can have a conversation. So right now, you know, I've got one question, but if you're in the audience and you've got another question that we haven't asked yet, feel free to type it into the uh, the chat box. Okay, we've got. Uh, are there any agencies that do lab work? Uh, yes, at Parks, we have uh, a lab here in Sacramento, um, and they definitely do lab work, and they take volunteers, um, as well as the possibility for getting seasonal work for, for new students, so definitely um, something worth looking into. We have a makeshift lab, um, but uh, maybe doesn't even qualify so it's only for small very small projects <clears throat> i think we have to uh rely on state parks when when we have a, a real project uh in-house yeah unfortunately caltrans relies almost entirely on the private side for lab processing we're trying to set up a a, a lab here in sacramento for specific projects um, to aid in, you know, um, getting experience for folks that are hired without much lab experience and, and the like, but we just don't have a lot of capa uh, capacity for lab. We used to, but um, when we expanded, um, that kind of was one of the first things that got contracted out. Yeah, and I'll say from the Forest Service side, while we uh, sometimes hold our own collections, we don't do a lot of lab work. We might do a little bit uh, more. We're going to apply that lab work out in the field in site recordings and evaluations of sites uh, in the field. Most of our lab work is going to be coming from a CRM company on a big project. are kind of coming in here faster. Uh, so then building on that uh, lab work question, is there a veterans curation program that does lab work, uh, provide opportunities for veterans out there? I know of that program. Um, there is a veterans program to teach uh, curation and, but I, I don't know of it personally, and we might tap into that if we have that need, but uh, we're not doing that a lot, at least not on the Forest Service side. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find that connection. I do know the program that you're talking about, and it's you know, an award-winning program, um, but uh, I'm new to California, so I wasn't sure if there was also a branch of that happening here in the state. Um, I'll see if I can find that while folks are in breakout rooms, but we've got a couple more questions. Um, uh, what drew these, what drew, does anyone want to respond to what caused you to focus your career in agency work over uh, academia or CRM? I mean, some folks have 
talked about that uh, process, but um, why agency work over CRM or academia? Um, for me, um, you know, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier that um, it's for me, it's been really great to um, see a project from uh, conception to execution. And um, a lot of times in CRM, you kind of you, you do your piece and then you never get to see what actually happens to it. You just kind of submit it and it goes away. Um, also, uh, because we are organized regionally, uh, it, I have a, a territory that I, I assist in managing. So um, I have descendant communities that I get to build relationships with. I have agency partners I get to build relationships with. And so you get to build, like I said, it's those relationships you get to build and help manage and assist with um, that's really fulfilling for me versus when I was in CRM and just bouncing around doing a survey here or an excavation there and standing in my report and moving on to the next thing. Security. And for me, is a big one. Yeah. if you go that long doing seasonal gigs or working on call, there's a, there's an appeal to agency work. I think my, my argument was, or my, my motivation was similar to that stability. Um, when I was in the private side, I was working up and down the state and sometimes in Oregon and Nevada, and you kind of had to, um, it was a, a lot, a lot of field time, a lot of um, working in, in, away from home, whereas agency offered a lot more of the ability to, to you know, work closer to home. Yeah, that breaking into the, the shovel bum life and uh, moving all around and not knowing when your next job's coming or how long the one job you're on is uh, going to stick around and going company to company, that was uh, really hard for me. And I, I found that you know, being in one spot, even if it was for six months, was was really nice and knowing I was going to have that paycheck. And then uh, I also, I always find that the term's funny, you know, I'm a federal archaeologist um, and, but, and I really manage the, the resource. I see it for the long term. I see it not just for one project, but, but for the 600 projects that might happen on that site while I'm working here and I could stay here for 20 years. Um, so I really feel like I'm managing that resource versus we talk about CRM and cultural resource management companies who do the one, one and gone, you know, one project and then they leave. Um, so I really do like to see a site and be able to manage it and protect it over the long run rather than that quick view. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Um, getting to manage resources in that Oroville region is a, is a big deal. Um, over the past four years, I've had an opportunity to yeah, really get a handle on kind of the regional archaeology, um, as well as just which sites are most important to the tribes, and you know all all of that. It's um, yeah, it makes a big difference, and it, 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 you have a more vested interest um, in those resources as well. Bring some personal value, professional value to the job. Yeah, to, to those reasons, it was always my dream of working for a federal agency that had, had land uh, that was, you know, this idea of managing resources and looking at resources. So, uh, you know, I didn't get that, but now I get to work with agencies that, that know your resources well. So I'm always appreciative of, of, of people at the, at the agencies like Ryland and uh, folks in the Forest Service that, that, that know their resources and know when some action that I'm part of is going to impact those resources and, um, you know, that they're managing them well, uh, that, it, it's always great to work with those agencies. Yeah, and I, I'm going to go ahead and add on the stability was a big thing for me too. Um, I uh, had two kids at the time, two young children at the time, and so uh, PG&E offered me uh, great benefits and stability. Um, and I actually, I'm going to go back and I put PG&E's uh, job link uh, in the chat earlier. Uh, we will be hiring at least three new uh, CRS this year. Um, and we have levels that start, uh, we've got like four different levels of uh, CRS that work for pg &E. The associate starts with two to three years experience, and then the journey starts at four to six years, and it goes up from there. So these opportunities will be coming up. And pg and &E, uh, all the CRS are actually part of a union. So we're members of the engineers and scientists of California. So our, our jobs are um, negotiated and protected. 
there's you you might also working for an agency at least if you're idealistic coming out of undergrad and and i think i've maintained this uh pretty well over the years uh, uh believe that you can affect change from the inside um and mm -hmm. and i think it's true to some extent you can um you have to yeah put put up a pretty good fight internally sometimes and and make good arguments and convince engineers and project proponents <laughs> that doing something is is worth it um and uh at the end of the day that can feel pretty good i will add that if you really love excavation and excavation is what you really want to do probably being an agency archaeologist is not the place to be <laughs> we don't do very much excavation yeah. or we get contractors to do it for us i was just going to follow up this susan that um, uh, rather than thinking one is better than the other it's what your desire or what phase that you're in um, at that point in your career uh, in the sense of getting fieldwork experience uh, that there's actually shovelbones.org is a, a job posting site, archaeologicalfieldwork.com. That's another travel, the, you know, travel the US, travel the world. Um, th if that's what you're the point that you at, there is comes a time that, or it, you may or may not have a time that you want to settle in one place, considering um, uh, uh, federal agencies, state agencies also. Usually, when you want to stay one place, you want to. Um, add on to your responsibilities and your roles as dealing with uh, the archaeology. So there comes in the consideration of advancement of, of, of degrees, master's degrees, and also kind of like um, if you want to go private versus public, there's pros and cons to each one. Each one I was going to kind of follow up and say that in working in the private sector, which have worked uh, both here in the West and then also the East Coast. When you have private developers, there is sometimes that conflict of interest where they want to build their big hotel. And if you say, wait a minute, we got to do a bunch of stuff or it's not possible, there is that kind of conflict. Uh, but there's the same type of conflict with agencies. But the one nice thing with working with the agency, you are advocating for compliance with the regulations, you are interacting with the descendant groups. So that um, level of comfort of being able to advocate on behalf, or I think it, of thinking of it being an advocate for the cultural heritage, you have that much more opportunity. So just think of it, what stage of growth that you want to in your career to participate in. All right, those that, those are excellent answers. I, I appreciate everyone's response. And it does seem like, you know, I, I personally, I did cultural resources for a long time. This is my first government job working for Cal. And so I can definitely see the benefits to both. You know, you do a lot of archaeology and cultural resources, but it is fragmented and it's, you know, project to project. And 10 days later, you could be fully done with your piece of that whole thing. And someone else goes on to spend a month excavating it and you never get to see what happens next. So you know, I, I definitely, um, I hear that. So uh, I wanted to go into rooms, but there's a question that probably, you know, re would require its own entire talk here about having a master's degree. So um, it was posted here in the discussion and I, I wanna, you know, share this here now, uh, even if that means that some of our time for networking is cut short because this matters a lot for students, you know, going to graduate school first, versus getting a job and then going to graduate school or just getting a job and never going to graduate school. I mean, this is something that I personally had to deal with and think about quite a bit. And I'm quite sure everyone, all the panelists, this is something that was on everyone's mind. But the question goes like, uh, does having a master's degree with a field school make you a better candidate to work at the state parks, forest service, I'm just gonna say, or any agency, or is it just good enough to have a field school and a bachelor's degree? I'd say starting out, just having a bachelor's in a field school. Uh, I didn't go back to get my master's until uh, 10 years into my career. Uh, I got that background of how to do the field, do field work and write reports, um, and then realized that I hit a ceiling where that I needed my master's degree. But um, to start out, Sometimes I would actually say when I look at a resume, if somebody just went bachelor's to master's degree, 
and has very little field work or very little or little or no experience that that's a warning sign for me i like would rather see more experience than a straight bachelor's to master's degree Jordan, quick uh yeah field school with bachelor's degree is definitely sufficient to get into the the entry level positions at parks mm -hmm. um and you can work your way up with just a bachelor's but eventually like lynn said you you will hit a ceiling there will be if you have broader you know goals within your career um, to become like a supervisor or something, you're really going to want that master's. And this is to suggest to clarify kind of um, requirements and stuff like that, especially with federal work is that it is in your stage of career, but to know that to go into a federal position as a professional archaeologist, which includes like the pay grade and all that stuff, there's what's called the Secretary of Interior Standards for Professional Qualification call them SOI standards. Uh, you can look at, you can Google it, Secretary of Interior Standards Qualifications for Archaeologists. It is required to have at least um, a, uh, the minimum of having a graduate degree in archaeology, anthropology, associated fields, and at least one year full-time experience, and at least four months of supervised fields and analytical experience. And sometimes it's added on to lab experience too. So do know that there's kind of qualifications you do hit a ceiling on what you can do project wise and how you can advance in both federal and I'm, I'm assuming also with state agencies on you know how you can advance to, with the graduate degree. Caltrans is a bit of a, a different animal we, we, with the program with the program level PA that we have to be able to do the full suite of analysis and have the full suite of responsibilities. A, a graduate degree is, is pretty much required at this point. Uh, we have two we have, you know, when we hire, we have an environmental planner and an associate environmental planner position um, level. Um, we pr tend to prefer associate environmental planners, though when we do put out new positions, we, we will consider environmental planners. But you'll see you can you can look at our qualification or the qualifications required to do the full amount of, of work under RPA. Um, it's it's right there in the PA and um, and, and it does require a master's degree. Um, that being said, we'll hire people without master's degrees, but at Caltrans it is definitely a, a huge plus. I feel like that was a great response uh, to that question. Um, okay, so now the magic begins, right? So normally we would have cookies and all that other stuff, but I, I mean, I guess everyone can imagine that they have cookies and, and you know, tea or whatever in front of you. Um, but uh, I'd like to make sure that there's enough time for the folks that are here to be able to meet some of you all personally in these smaller breakout rooms. Uh, but before we go into the breakout rooms, I want to thank everyone for your time. I mean, uh, sharing this kind of information. This is the kind of stuff that students don't normally get in, uh, in, in our classes. And so this is absolutely invaluable. And it's also coming from people who are excellent and experienced and who have lived this pathway. So, uh, you know, when you're a student, you see us professors quite regularly, but you don't see the other side of the you know, 90% of archaeologists that don't work at universities. And so this is invaluable experience. And um, each year I've been uh, really proud to be part of this thing that the archaeological research facility has put together. And uh, some of you folks have uh, come in, and given talks before. And I just want to thank you sincerely for sharing your time and your experience and your stories, your origin tales with us all. If you come back again, I won't make you do the origins again because we recorded it, right? unless you have more embellishments, you remember some other facet that we never got to hear about, you know, that's great. But, um, you know, if folks are hiring, there's students who are eager, they wanna get work. And um, I wanna make sure that there's enough time here for them to talk with you all. But thanks for staying here on Friday afternoon and uh, sharing your, your careers with us. So Sarah, I think you'll, you'll take over on creating the rooms. I know I'm a, 
Yep, I have the rooms created. And I just okay. want to thank you, Bill, as well, for moderating. You did a fabulous job. And um, thank you for taking time out on your Friday afternoon. And also to all the panelists on behalf of the ARF, I'd like to thank you all for coming and giving your time here today as well. And for people listening in, um, we're going to, we'll copy the chat and share all those links that people have been putting in the chat. So um, people in the future can watch the video and, and get access to the those links from the chat as well. So again, right now, um, I've created breakout rooms just with each person has their own room. You can pop into a room. You can come back and pop into another room. So if the panelists would just hang around for a little while, um, you may get a couple of different visitors over the next 15 minutes or so. But um, after that, we can all just, it's as if we ate our cookies and said goodbye. So I think um, I want to thank you now for coming. And I'm going to open up. Thank you, too. Um, thank you so much. I just want to pop in and say thanks. I'm Christine Hassler, the director, and I've enjoyed every minute of this. It's really been extremely informative. So. I hope all the students, uh, the youth, the hi hirees are uh, getting a lot out of this too. I'm sure they are. So thanks a lot and have fun. Have a good weekend.